I'm Caleb Boat. I am a junior here at the University of Michigan, and I'm majoring in neuroscience and evolutionary anthropology. And this footage is footage I took when I went to Uganda um, on a Europe summer fellowship, which is with the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program. And I was given $4,000 to conduct uh, a research project on chimpanzee morphology. And I went with John Matani, anthropology professor here at the University of Michigan. I spent a total of five weeks in Africa conducting this research study. You know my favorite part about being in Gogo is uh, walking here. I, I, you know, like at, at the end of the day, it's so pretty. Go, go for it. So this is a shot of us actually doing what we set out to do. Um, this is the grad student Aaron Sandell. And essentially what he's doing here is taking pictures with lasers. There's a, uh, a laser apparatus set on the bottom of the camera. And what he does is wait for the, a chimpanzee to get up and walk in front of him orthogonally from the camera. And when, he, when that happens, when the uh, chimp will w walks across, he turns on the laser, which gives us essentially a scale bar on the body of the chimpanzee. And we can use that um, uh, in post to essentially say, oh, we, we can make an estimate of how large the chimpanzee is because we have the scale bar. And that's done in Photoshop or another photo editing software. So that was our goal, essentially, to go out and collect this data on chimpanzee morphology. So here we have, I should, yeah, so he, chimp walks across the path. Aaron turns on the laser, um, takes the pictures. We have a range finder, which is essentially it's a laser as well, and you, we shine it at the base of where the chimp was walking and record how far away we were from nice. the chimpanzee when the picture was taken, and that was my job, record that data. So identifying the chimpanzees at, at, the, at the outside of this project was very difficult because they looked so similar. For the first three or four weeks of the study, I had to stay with Aaron because I had to be able to identify the chimps. So I wasn't able to go out and collect the data on my own because to collect the data, you have to be able to say, oh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Cash or I'm looking at one of the other chimps. Like you have to be able to say, I know who this is. So you can pair it later on with their body size because that was the goal. Find out how large each of these individual members in the community are. It takes a lot of time. I started drawing caricatures. I don't know if you, saw, you might have seen it. I was drawing caricatures of the chimps that was my job, trying to identify 34 adult males by sight. And sometimes you would only see their butt. So this was my attempt to get close to the chimps uh, visually. GoPro is a great camera, but of course it does not have a zoom function uh, or whatsoever. So everything I took while I was in Uganda was from essentially my point of view, my perspective. So I tried to overcome this because I really wanted to get some close shots of the chimps by taking a pair of binoculars and turning them on its side. So I'd have the top, and so I had a, a headband where the uh, GoPro was resting on my forehead, and I'd press one viewfinder up against the lens of the GoPro as best as I could fit it, and then the other viewfinder I'd try to like have as a telescope so I could aim and actually see what I was seeing, uh, try to see what I was uh, looking at. So this is my attempt, and this might have been one of my best attempts to actually get close to one of the chimps with this GoPro camera. This is a baby, so I don't know the, this guy's name. It might be Orf. It's hard to tell. But it's probably Orf, because I saw him a lot, and he was kind of a goofball. So this is, I believe it is Cash. I want to say that's the first chimp I saw at Gogo. -Go. He was the first one I saw, so he's pretty special. He was laying down. He's just chilling. And I finally, you know, I'm guessing where, where to put this, um, bin the binoculars. But he held still, and I managed to get it just right. And actually got his face. So I was really happy with this when I got back to camp. I actually uploaded it to my computer. I was like, yes, finally. Because I tried so hard to get one shot where the viewfinder actually was, you had the full circle so you could actually see exactly what you're looking through in the, in the binoculars. The name of the field research site is Ngogo. It's spelled N-G-O-G-O. -G -O. It's sort of interesting because I can never pronounce it right. I said Ngogo before I showed up and the grad student I worked with, he was like, mm -go -go. <laughs> and you have to say it like, mm -go -go. and it took me a so long to get it right. So that's my structure over there on the right. 
This is the, uh, the main hut where people would come during the day to recharge um, laptops and camera batteries because everything was run on solar power. So on the roof of this shelter, um, there were several solar panels that you could plug into um, and they, it, the solar panels charged a car battery. So everything was being run through that. Those were some skulls of baboons. They're, the chimps co-inhabit the forest with uh, groups of baboons. They don't normally interact so much, but you will see them sometimes together. So this could be on any day. So sometimes you'll lose the chimps. They'll just, you know, you're not gonna find, or you'll go out in the morning and maybe no one tracked them to where they bedded the night before. So that's generally how you, f you, you knew where to go in the morning. Like each day you know, okay, well the chimps are at a certain point on this grid system. So the whole trail system was set up into lines and rows. So that's how you um, know where to go. So you'd be like, oh, the chimps are at E5 this morning. You should go there first before they wake up. And they normally woke up at around like 6, 6.30 or when the sun broke. So you try to go before that if you could. So sometimes we go out in the morning, even if we didn't get a late start, and maybe we just couldn't find them, where they, or someone was inaccurate in where they said they were, you'd go out and you'd just sit on a log, and you could spend easily, wow, like an hour or two, just sitting in complete silence on a log, waiting to hear a call. This is a cool shot. One, because you get to see Ambrose, who's a field assistant at the site. This is um, in the middle of a red colobus hunt. A preferred food for chimpanzees is red colobus monkey. And there are 38 male chimpanzees, so they, they go in large groups. And when they hear the red colobus, they, their focus is completely on the food that's ab above their heads. We have a couple researchers spread out in this area. Everyone's sort of looking at different uh, chimps, trying to track, okay, well, who got what? Um, did anyone even get any food? Oh, wow. Oh, he got it. He got it. Uh, Basie has it. Basie has an infant. So here we will be targeting to see who he shares with. Okay. Yeah. And so you can see Ambrose is back here and off to the right, about maybe 15, 20 feet in front of us, the chimps are all huddled around the one chimp who got the meat. We have one of the older adult males here, and probably some lower ranking adult males sharing part of this red colobus kill. So that was really cool. That was uh, a very interesting experience. I got my heart beating for, for sure. An interesting legend about uh, Ngogo is that we have a, the killing moon. So sometimes the moon would shine a bright red, especially when it was full, and that we called that the killing moon. And the joke was something is always gonna die the next day. And apparently it's come true almost every single time at Ngogo. And it just so happened, it came true every single time that I was there too. Whenever there was a red moon. This is at the intersection F4.5, which I think I'll always remember because that was sort of the, the main point where you knew you were getting close to camp. There's the river and the trail, and you, this is the one you need to remember. Get back to F4.5 and you'll find your way home. Going there was incredible beyond words. Just getting to work with animals that are endangered is, is quite the experience and it's really uh, something that not many people get to do and, and very likely that many people in the future will never have the chance to do. I thought that when I went there, it was gonna, a large part of the challenge would be the physical aspect and just hiking for you know, 10 to 12 hours a day, chasing the chimps at a relatively high altitude and um, doing that. But a lot of it was mental as well and it really pushed the limits of what I thought I was capable of and also showed me things that where I really need to improve. So getting that kind of that feedback just by way of going to Africa and conducting this research study was something that I'm never going to forget.